You know what this is? Well, if you're a crossword puzzle fan, you know his name. This is a baby AI. Yes, this is that uh, two-letter word meaning a three-toed sloth. Or sloth, if you prefer. The dictionary says that uh, it's sloth or sloth, but sloth is preferred. This little fellow is a puzzle, not only to the crossword puzzle fan, but also to the scientist. He's perhaps one of the most misunderstood and least known of all God's creatures. Oh, he's slow, all right. He seems to be stuck in low gear. I guess he's the world's most famous slow motion acrobat. Now, there are a lot of very wonderful things about this little fellow and some of his relatives. We're going to study them for a while in the laboratory. But uh, here's something else we'll need. It has some very interesting information. Mr. Udy? Yes, sir. I wonder if you'd help me here just a minute, see if we can get this little fellow untangled. Mr. Udy is one of our top photographers here at Moody Institute of Science. He's just returned from several months down in the jungles in Panama. He's been working at the Smithsonian Institute Jungle Research Laboratory. Now, don't go too far away, Ed. We're going to need you in a minute for a first-hand account. This book now, Count Buffon, a French naturalist, wrote it in 1812. Buffon was a genius in many ways, and he made fine contributions to science. But uh, frankly, his descriptions of the sloth were not the most accurate of his writings. I want to read just a little bit to you while you take a very good look at the sloth. The sloth constitutes the last term of existence in the order of animals endowed with flesh and blood. They are imperfect sketches of nature, hardly endowed with the faculty of existence. They have no cutting teeth. The thighs are ill-jointed to the haunches. The legs are too short, ill-turned, and terminated still worse. The sloth have no weapons, either offensive or defensive. Slowness, habitual pain, and stupidity are the results of this strange and bungled conformation. One more defect would have totally prevented their existence. Now, we don't want to seem to be picking on Count Buffon, but it's not going to be too difficult to show that there are many errors in what we've read. Others have made their mistakes also in regard to the slope. The modern taxonomist, for example, is quite embarrassed by the fact that the sloth is classified as in the order of edentates. So that means toothless. Mr. Udy, would you agree with this classification? No, I can't agree with that. <laughs> Looks like you have some first-hand information there. Do you suppose you can get one of the boys to show his teeth? I think I can. <laughs> OK. Be careful now. Don't take any chances there. If you're wondering about the speed at which this sloth is moving, don't worry about it. This is a different kind of sloth. This one's called Calathus. It's a two-toed sloth, and he's got a high gear. His movements and uh, his reactions are much more rapid than those of the three-toed sloth. Uh, Ed, would you get the baby again for us? You see, the little fella is Bradipus, the three-toed sloth. Now, all sloths have uh, three toes on their hind feet, but this little fellow has three toes on his front feet as well. Now, Ed, you've spent quite a bit of time down there in the jungles in Panama where these sloths live, studying their habits and so forth. What do you think about this statement of Buffon that the sloth is a misfit and one more mistake and he couldn't possibly have existed? Well, I don't know of anything that could be farther from the truth. In fact, I've never seen an animal more perfectly suited for its environment. Speaking of environment, uh, what does he eat? Well, he's strictly a vegetarian, cecropia leaves, and well, cecropia leaves. <laughs> you know, it would seem to be quite a disadvantage to be restricted to just one form of diet, just to the cecropia leaf. But it so happens that where this little fellow comes from, there are a lot of cecropia leaves. From the Amazon country in South America to the tropical jungles of Panama, cecropia trees grow in abundance. And anywhere you see the distinctive leaf of this particular tree, there's always the possibility that not too far away, a sloth might be dining on his highly preferred bill of fare. This unusual animal, if he isn't disturbed, will continue to munch away for long periods of time. Notice how slowly and methodically he chews his food. 
and considering the size of the slope, the amount of food consumed is surprisingly small. His meals are never hurried and he never eats too much, even though his favorite delicacy is all around him. So where eating habits are concerned, the sloth seems more practical than man. And after lunch always comes a nap. Yes, and before lunch too, for that matter. For you see, a sloth will spend as much as 80% of its entire lifetime asleep in a tree. You know, Ed, it would seem that an animal asleep in a tree would be an easy prey to its enemies. Doesn't the sloth have enemies? Yes, it does. The harpy eagle, the big snakes such as the boa constrictor or the anaconda. Then there are certain of the cats that like to make a meal of a sloth once in a while, too, such as the jaguar or the ocelot. Well, now, that looks kind of bad for the sloth, Ed, because, you know, Count Buffon here tells us that the sloth doesn't have any means of defending itself. Well, once again, I'd like to disagree with Count Buffon. It seems to me the sloth has a number of defenses. You mean he can fight back? No, I was thinking of the passive type of defense, such as camouflage. Well, that's a good one, Ed. Let's have some fun. Let's see if you can find a sloth in a cecropia tree. That's right, there's one. But how about this one? Or this one? Are you sure you see one? Let's move in a little closer. Pretty well camouflaged, isn't he? A very effective way of hiding from his natural enemies. By moving slowly and deliberately, the slope can even travel through the trees without attracting much attention. But so long as the animal remains perfectly still, it's almost impossible to see it among the cecropia leaves. To further complicate the matter, the cecropia tree is many times the host to a termite's nest. And seen from the ground, a termite's nest and a sloth bear a striking resemblance. Especially when the sloth is all curled up sound asleep. And you know, once a sloth is curled up into a ball, knocking him loose from that position is not an easy thing to do. Isn't that right, Ed? Right. There are stories also about how tough this little fellow's skin is. Well, down in the jungle, the natives say that sometimes their arrows even fail to penetrate their skin. Looks like another defense for this uh, defenseless little creature. Now, his first line of defense is this fur. The outer coating is very wiry and tough. Then down next to the skin, he has a very thick coating of fine fur. And the skin, very, very tough. And then one more, his ribs. They're broad and flat, and he has a lot more of them than most animals. Buffon tells us that uh, this number of ribs is an excess, an error of nature. But let's see. Way out there in the end of a limb, with this heavy fur and the very tough skin, and then these ribs acting like armor plate around his vital organs, well, uh, he's quite well defended, isn't he? Ed. Are there any other defenses that this little fellow has? Well, it always seemed unusual to me that the sloth, unlike other animals, has no odor that would betray its presence. Even the babies don't smell like babies. Now, when you add to all of this the fact that the sloth is a silent animal, scarcely ever making a sound that would betray its presence, you realize that the sloth is an animal with a number of defenses. A monstrosity, a pitiful defect, a blunder of nature. It's entirely possible that these descriptions reflect the ignorance of man rather than the true nature of the sloth. In the light of better understanding, it begins to appear that God has beautifully fashioned a very unusual animal for a highly extraordinary existence. Even the babies have been wonderfully provided for. The upside down position of the mother provides the baby with a safe, comfortable cradle. All the baby needs to do is hang on, and that's the one thing it can do best. When the mother rolls up into a ball, which she will do for long periods of time, the baby is safe in the center. Now notice how the hair parts at the top of the head and then tapers down to the bottom. 
Now, every bradypus or three-toed sloth has exactly this same hair pattern. But notice the hair on the two-toed sloth. There doesn't seem to be any particular place of parting, but it all slants downward to taper off along the back. An accident? No, it has a very real purpose. You see, in the jungles, there's a considerable amount of rainfall, and the sloth has no nest or dwelling place. So God has provided a thatched roof. The slanting hair provides a perfect watershed. Now, God could have stopped here, but he didn't. He also provided the animal with a miraculous means of changing color. On the hair of the sloth lives a microscopic algae, and when the sloth is perfectly dry, the algae appear only as a dirty brown, generally scattered pigment, toning down the ivory whiteness of the lighter hairs. Now, when the hair of the sloth is wet, even after a short time, the whole surface takes on a greenish color. Ed, do you suppose we could borrow a hair from the little fellow here? Sure, I don't think Junior mind a bit. Thank you very much. <laughs> he really hangs on tight, doesn't he? Thank you, Ed. Now, the microscope, even with low power, will reveal that the hair of the sloth is quite unusual has an entirely different structure from the hair of most other animals. Magnified, the hair of the sloth looks very much like a string of beads. Dryness has caused tiny cracks to appear with pronounced regularity along the surface. Now, in order to discover what happens when the sloth encounters a rainstorm, let's soak the hair for a moment in some ordinary water. Then return it to the microscope. A striking change has taken place. The algae is a bright green. God has seen to it that when the rains come, the sloth blends in with the greenery, a camouflage suited to the seasons. Now, uh, suppose someone came up behind you and fired a gun when you least expected it. You'd jump, wouldn't you? Watch this. From an experiment like this, one might conclude that the sloth is deaf. But he isn't deaf. He's not dead either. Far from it. The other day, we made the mistake of leaving one of these sloths alone, and he got down from the tree, climbed over on the chemical table, and broke some of the chemical glassware. And as we were sweeping the floor, the tinkle of the glass caused a very noticeable reaction from the sloth. This is the glass that we swept up. Now what? Why? Well, I don't know. I suppose it could be the frequency of the sound. Or maybe it's tied up with the experience he had over there with the chemical. It is interesting to note that the same sound doesn't seem to affect the other sloths. There's a lot we need to learn about these fellows, isn't there? One thing is certain. A mother sloth can hear that soft, plaintive, high-pitched cry of her baby much further than we can. Much has been written about the insensitiveness of the sloth. Some writers have described the animal as having an opaque veil over his senses. Well, certainly his senses are different than ours. His eyes, for example, are most unusual. They appear almost round, and the absence of eyelashes gives the sloth a peculiar staring look. The pupil is quite small, and the retina of the eye is composed only of rods. There are no cones with which to determine color. To the sloth, the world is a world of black and white. Why does a sloth scratch himself? Well, probably because he's the only one who knows where it itches. But seriously, the fact that he has this problem at all would indicate that the sloth has a somewhat higher order of sensitivity than most writers have attributed to it. The termites that build their nests in the Cecropia trees construct tunnels of mud along the surface of the bark. And then, slowly but surely, go to work on the tree itself. So the question arises, how does the sloth know what is and what isn't a good limb to travel on? 
According to Dr. William Beebe, the sloth is able to detect rotten branches that might break and cause him to fall simply by his sense of smell. And there's another difference between the senses of the sloth and a human being. The temperature regulating mechanism in the sloth is quite different from man's. Man's temperature remains constant regardless of the temperature of his surroundings. Whether he is at the North Pole or out in the desert, his temperature remains 98.6 degrees. But with the sloth, it's different. His temperature varies with the temperature of the air surrounding him. When the weather is hot, his temperature goes up. When the weather is cold, his temperature lowers. Ed, would you give us a hand, please? You suppose we can get this fellow down on the table? Well, we can try. <laughs> now, relax. Don't worry about the sloth. If uh, anybody gets hurt, believe me, it won't be him. I'll take this in. Okay. He doesn't do so well on a slick surface, does he? But you know something? The sloth wasn't made to live on a table in a laboratory. The sloth was made to live in a jungle. And given plenty of time, he can make good progress, even on the ground. He may be awkward and comparatively slow as he travels along in this ungainly manner, but to say that the sloth is confined to the treetops would certainly be in error. On one occasion, a sloth was marked and 48 days later, it was found again. During that time, it had traveled through four miles of jungle and had crossed a river one mile wide. Yes, believe it or not, a sloth can swim. And for some unknown reason, a sloth will many times take to the water and swim great distances. And he has a stroke like a channel swimmer. A sloth will average almost four miles an hour as it paddles its way along. An amazing animal, created to travel upside down, but capable of traveling any number of ways. Of course, the animal may prefer the branches of the trees. That's where he functions the best. And that's the safest place for him to be. But then, there's really no problem involved, because getting back where he came from is a relatively simple matter. To some who have studied the animal, the sloth may have looked stupid. It may have seemed to have a low level of intelligence. Its senses may have appeared dull and clouded. But the fact remains that our slow motion acrobat is a highly successful creature when it comes to thriving in its natural environment. Have you learned anything from the sloth? Well, at least you crossword puzzle fans know what an AI is now, don't you? But I'm sure that there are things of more lasting value that we can gather from this experience. For one thing, we found that books are not always accurate. Now, I don't want to speak disparagingly of books. They're good friends. But it is important for us to learn that absolute perfection is not always one of their virtues. By Count Fafon, for example, it's well over a hundred years old, and of course it isn't surprising at all to find that it contains errors. In fact, it would be most amazing if it didn't contain some errors. It's also quite probable that a hundred years from now, our great-grandchildren will be discovering errors in the books that we're writing today. Finding mistakes in a book that's a hundred years old certainly is no great achievement. But you know, if we were to discover a book that is hundreds or even thousands of years old that did not contain mistakes, it would be amazing. It would take a bit of explaining, wouldn't it? It wouldn't be natural. It would be supernatural. Is there such a book? I'm convinced that there is. Now, I've spent my life studying two books. One is the book of nature, that is science. The other? The Bible. I don't know this book nearly as well as I'd like to know it, but I have studied it carefully. I've covered every word from beginning to end many times, 
And so far as I know, there is not within the pages of this book one single scientific inaccuracy, contradiction, absurdity, or blunder. Oh, I know, we've all heard that the Bible is just full of mistakes. Robert Ingersoll wrote a book on the subject. He called it The Mistakes of Moses. Now, some of his arguments seem just a little silly to us in the light of what we know now, but in its day, a lot of people took it quite seriously. But somehow, I'd be a lot more interested in a book by Moses on the mistakes of Robert Ingersoll. In fact, I imagine that about now, Robert Ingersoll could write a pretty good book on the mistakes of Robert Ingersoll. But seriously, from a human point of view, the Bible ought to be full of mistakes, and it certainly ought not to be hard to find them. Remember this, some 44 men were involved in the writing of the Bible. They wrote over a period of 20 centuries. They wrote in different countries, in different languages. There's no possibility that there could have been collusion between them. And yet the Bible is one book, with perfect unity from beginning to end. Also, think of this. Man has learned an awful lot in the last 3,000 years. When you consider the fact that the writing of this book began more than 3,500 years ago, even a partial scientific accuracy would be quite miraculous, wouldn't it? Now, all you have to do to be thoroughly convinced on this subject is to make a study of the scientific environment in which the Bible was written. That is, find out what the men in those days believed and accepted as scientific fact. And it's quite a study. Some ancients, for example, believed that the Earth was a winged egg which flew too close to the sun and hatched out. The Babylonians believed that the Earth came about as a result of a battle between two giant gods. Now, as I recall the story, uh, their names were Mardu and Tiamat, by the way. I think Mardu won. He rolled Tiamat up into a ball and tied his tail to his nose, and that ball became the Earth. Now, where did men come from and life? Well. They said, wherever Mardu spit on Tiamat, a man grew, and wherever a man spit, an animal grew. It doesn't seem possible, but that remained unchallenged as scientific fact for some time. Finally, I guess it involved a little too much spit for the younger generation, so they developed the theory that the trees and vegetation on the earth were just uh, the hair on the giant. And uh, men and animals, well, we were just lice or vermin crawling around on this dead giant. Quite a concept. During the period that the Bible was written, ignorance and superstition and foolishness completely dominated the minds of men. So far as I know, there is no possible human explanation for the fact that the error of the times in which the Bible was written did not creep into the writing. The Bible doesn't include the error. It doesn't uh, attack it. It just ignores it with sublime indifference. Now, some ancients firmly believed that the Earth was a hemisphere which stood on four giant elephants that stood on a turtle. Could they prove it? Why, of course. What caused earthquakes if it weren't the elephants getting restless? And yet, Job, writing more than 3,000 years ago, dared to say, which must have then seemed with utter illogic, he hangeth the Earth upon nothing. In some way, the men who penned the words of this book seem to be able to rise above their time and look with perfect clarity to the end of time. Now, why, in view of all this, have men found it necessary to attack the Bible and seek to destroy it? I believe it is because thinking men find something in the nature of this book which they cannot ignore. No thinking man can know the Bible and remain neutral concerning it. After all, if the Bible is what it claims to be, the word of God, then a thinking man has no choice but to accept the mastery of this book, the absolute authority of this book, to govern and rule his conduct and his life. Now, if he's unwilling to do that, well, then he's got to seek to destroy it or disprove it. Voltaire was such a man. Unwilling to accept the mastery of this book in his life, he spent his life seeking to destroy it. During his lifetime, Voltaire predicted that within a hundred years, there wouldn't be a single copy of the Bible left in existence. Two hundred years have gone by. And today, year after year, the Bible is the world's bestseller. I don't know the figures, but I imagine that every year now, more copies of the Bible are printed and distributed than even existed at the time Voltaire made his prediction. Hitler sought to destroy the Bible and was himself destroyed. 
Yes, and today, once again, the enemies of our freedom are seeking to destroy the Bible. Why? Because they see in it something they fear more than the power of the atom. In its simple truth, they see that which could wipe out their godless materialism and their pagan culture. Can they destroy the Bible? No. But they can destroy us. Other civilizations have forsaken faith and morality and have become corrupt and decadent and weak and have been overrun by a barbarian horde. The pages of history are full of it. It's happened time and time and time again, and it can happen yet again, and to us. If today our Christian civilization is weak, it's weak because we have forsaken our source of strength. Yes. If we have lost our sense of right and wrong, it's because we have forsaken the source of our morality. And if our young people have forsaken their faith and they've turned to godless materialism and pagan unbelief, it's because we have failed to hedge them about daily with the source of faith. Many people seem to treat this Bible as though it were an amulet or a charm to ward off evil, feeling that if somehow they just carry it around with them, or if they have it in their homes, there's some magic power to protect them. Now remember this, the Bible is miraculous, but it certainly isn't magic. No, the Bible, of course, is different from any other book in that, uh, well, it has a different source, different content. But also, this Bible is the same as any other book. In this respect, if it's going to do us any good, we've got to know and believe what's in it. How well do you know the Bible? How long has it been since you spent even a half hour studying it? How long has it been since you had family Bible reading in your home? You know, if an enemy were to come into our homes today and seek to take this Bible from us by force, we'd fight to defend it, wouldn't we? And yet, in millions upon millions of homes, the Bible lies neglected on some shelf, forgotten, gathering dust. Do you remember the sloth? Do you remember those who spoke about that opaque veil over his senses? Who are we to speak of dullness? When in this time of our national peril, we fail to recognize in this book our greatest offensive and defensive weapon. Our greatest offensive weapon to the tearing down of the strongholds of evil in the world and our greatest defensive weapon to the preservation of our freedom and our faith. You know, we hear a lot these days about collective security. Oh, how we need it. But you say, what can I as an individual do about it? Ah. It's only as an individual that you can do anything about it. For the only hope of our civilization today is that we get back to God and that we get back to the salvation that he offers us in the pages of his holy word. And that, my friend, is an individual matter.